Black and white invasion stripes are an iconic sight on the aircraft of D-Day. The story of how they got there is a story of one of the bloodiest friendly fire incidents of World War II. It's a story of how one of the invasion's biggest problems was solved with a simple solution done at breakneck speed. In short, it's the story of how a simple coat of paint saved lives. The Air Force assembled for the Normandy landings would be the largest Air Force ever. At their disposal, Allied planners had over 3,000 heavy bombers, more than 1,500 medium, light, and torpedo bombers, over 5,000 fighters, more than 12,000 transports and troop carrier aircraft, and over 600 gliders. In fact, if you total up all the fixed-wing aircraft Allied planners could use for the D-Day landings, you get an Air Force larger than Russia, China, and the United States today combined. This massive air force would be partnered with a massive naval force, one with over a thousand warships, more than 4,000 landing craft, and over 800 merchant ships and transports packed with men and supplies headed for the invasion beaches. And all of these warships and transports were bristling with guns, and aircraft guns manned by nervous, scared, inexperienced, seasick young Allied gunners ready to shoot down the first German aircraft they saw or thought they saw. And these two forces would collide on a stretch of the French coastline just 50 miles long. The potential for a tragic case of mistaken identity was enormous. Just one Allied gunner making just one mistake could lead to the deaths of hundreds of Allied airmen. And Allied planners had good reason to be worried about this, because it had already happened. In July 1943, the British and American had launched Operation Husky, the first major invasion of Europe during their landings on Sicily. And on the night of July 11th, the American paratroopers of the 504th Regimental Combat Team boarded their transport aircraft and headed for Sicily. The first wave landed uneventfully, but as the second wave approached the Allied convoys waiting off the coast of the invasion beaches and prepared to drop their men, everything went wrong. Historians Albert Garland and Howard Smith describe what happened next. Quote, The calm was rudely shattered by a lone machine gun. Within the space of minutes, it seemed as though every Allied anti-aircraft gun in the beachhead and offshore was blasting planes out of the sky. The slow-flying, majestic columns of aircraft were like sitting ducks. General Bradley, the Second Corps commander, watched in helpless fury as the anti-aircraft fire from both ground and naval batteries cut the troop carrier formations to pieces. End quote. Troop carrier aircraft packed with paratroopers blew up in midair, killing everyone on board. Paratroopers descending to the earth were machine gunned and killed in their harnesses. Some aircraft were so badly damaged they had to turn for home their bullet-riddled fuselages packed with dead, wounded, and dying men, their floorboards stained with blood. Just one jumpy Allied gunner, spooked by German air attacks earlier in the day, had made a tragic mistake that had killed or wounded over 300 Americans and led to the destruction or damage of over 60 troop carrier aircraft. And then the next night, the same thing happened. During Operation Fustian, British paratroopers of the 1st Parachute Brigade prepared to drop on key beaches, I beg your pardon, key bridges just behind the Allied landing sites at Sicily. But a portion of their formation strayed off course and was shot at by an Allied convoy. In the confusion, two planes collided, killing everyone on board. Two more planes were shot down, and nine planes were so badly damaged they too had to turn back for North Africa once again full of dead, wounded, and dying men. In history, lessons are often written in blood, and the lesson from Sicily had been very bloody and very clear. If they were going to invade Normandy with over 2,000 aircraft and over 6,000 vessels, Allied planners needed a way to prevent a repeat of these friendly fire incidents. Now, there was a high-tech solution available. The first IFF, or identification friend or foe systems did exist. These systems sent out a signal that could be picked up on a radar scope, 
letting the operator know the contact was friendly. And IFF worked very well when it was telling apart a small number of friendly aircraft from a small number of enemy aircraft. But with thousands of aircraft filling the skies over the Normandy beaches, there would have been so many IFF systems, the airwaves would have been swamped with signals. It just wouldn't have worked. And so clearly, a low-tech solution was needed. And Allied planners opted for perhaps the lowest-tech solution of all, paint. Just before the Normandy landings, they decided that every single aircraft in the invasion force would be painted with what we now call invasion stripes. Fighter aircraft would get 18-inch black and white stripes, two black stripes on the fuselage and on the wings, and three white stripes on the fuselage and on the wings. Larger twin-engine aircraft like this Misito would get the same stripe pattern, but just larger ones, 24 inches black, 24 inches white. But in order to keep the invasion stripes secret, Allied planners elected to not tell anyone until the very last minute. And they had good reasons for doing this. If the Germans saw them, they could copy them, and that would defeat the entire purpose of having invasion stripes. But even more seriously, if the Germans suddenly saw the Allies painting thousands of aircraft with stripes, they would realize something was up. They would realize an invasion was imminent, and that would also be a serious problem. That would allow the Germans time to rally their forces and prepare their defenses. And so, again, the thousands of aircraft and the thousands of airmen flying these airplanes weren't aware of the invasion stripes until the very last moment. The troop carrier squadrons that would carry paratroopers and tow gliders were only told about the stripes until the, on the morning of June 3rd. Now, we all know D-Day was on June 6th, and that seems like a lot of time, but you have to remember the timetable here. Remember, D-Day was actually supposed to be on June 5th, and the paratroopers, well, they were supposed to take off on June 4th, very late on June 4th, and drop early on the morning of June, and drop early on June 5th. Now, because of weather delays, D-Day was pushed back until June 6th, but again, they didn't have that much time to get their aircraft ready. One member of a troop carrier squadron, Captain Robert Urig, remembered in his diary at about 10,000 yesterday, June 3rd, Major McMenamin called all the engineering officers together and told us that we had to get our ships ready for a mission. We had to paint every ship in the squadron with five black and white stripes in the rear of the cabin and five on each wing. We finished at about 0545 this morning, so we were all about dead. It has been kept secret about the painting so the Germans too could not duplicate it. The engineering officers are the only ones in the squadron that knew about it beforehand. It is to try and keep our own men from shooting our ships down like they did in Sicily. After the Sicily experience, you can imagine that the troop carrier pilots were glad to have a little extra help in identifying friend from foe, but it was still an exhausting task to get that many aircraft done that quickly. And the fighter and bomber units, they had even less notice. They weren't told about it until June 4th. An airman from one fighter outfit recalled, an order came down that required all aircraft to be marked with so-called invasion stripes. The stripes were to be applied around both wings, and in our case, around both tail booms. There would be five alternating bands of white, black, 18 inches in width. With 18 P-38s to be painted, terror arose in my heart. How was I ever going to accomplish this in two days? I started masking and spraying. What I saw next was both welcome and upsetting. There were the ground crews, armed with six-inch paintbrushes, slopping the paint onto those beautiful aircraft. Some were taking the time to mask at the edges, but some weren't even bothering to do that. It broke my heart. Even though I had come to the realization that this was the only way the job would get done in time. In just the space, in the space of barely 48 hours, Allied ground crews had to paint nearly 10,000 aircraft with these invasion stripes. And incredibly enough, working at a fever pitch, they were able to do it. Using sprayers, paintbrushes, and even mops, they got the job done. And even though their work was sometimes crude, it proved to be enough. Remarkably enough, on D-Day, the stripes worked, and they worked well. Not a single Allied aircraft was lost to friendly fire, even though hundreds of sorties were being flown every single hour in support of the landings. 
there was no repeat of Sicily. There was no repeat of the massacre that had killed so many Allied pilots and so many Allied paratroopers. The invasion stripes didn't see the end of the war. After the invasion, most units painted over the stripes to camouflage their aircraft again. After all, the stripes did make the aircraft very distinctive, and that wasn't always a good thing in air-to-air -air combat. However, a few did soldier on until late 1944. Fighter-bomber units found the stripes were a useful way to identify themselves to friendly ground troops. And so although they painted over the stripes on the top of the aircraft, they kept the ones on the underside as a way to quickly identify who they were to Allied gunners on the ground. Today, the invasion stripes are an icon of the D-Day landings. And that's very fitting because of what they represent. They represent the fears of the D-Day planners and the difficult tasks and difficult decisions they had to make when sending so many young men to their fate. They represent the ingenuity and grit of the ground crews who scrambled to get so much done with so little so quickly. And above all else, they represent the unity of purpose that made D-Day possible. Because ultimately the stripes were about getting people to work together. About getting the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of more than a dozen allied nations to literally see each other as friends and join together to begin the liberation of Europe.